Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Nick Robbins, uh, Professor in Practice of Sustainable Finance at uh, the London School of Economics. Um, welcome to this uh, webinar. I hope you can all hear me. So this uh, webinar is to present and discuss uh, a new uh, report, a toolbox uh, for how central banks and supervisors can uh, integrate climate change and sustainability into their crisis response measures. Uh, this is a, a report that I'm delighted to co-author uh, with uh, Uli Voltz, who's the director of the SOAS Centre for Sustainable Finance uh, at the University of London, and also my colleague uh, Simon Dickow, who's a research officer at the Grantham Research Institute at the LSE, and also manages the Inspire Network. So INSPIRE is uh, an uh, in international network, uh, the International Network for Sustainable Finance Policy Insights Research and Exchange. Uh, it's been set up to provide uh, insights and research uh, to aid central banks in their task of greening uh, the financial system. Uh, I'm delighted to co-chair INSPIRE along with uh, Ilmi, De Ilmi, uh, Ilmi uh, Granhoff uh, from the Climate Works uh, Foundation. So uh, today we'll have a, a presentation um, from uh, Uli Voltz and uh, Simon Dickau, and then we're delighted to have two leading uh, respondents, uh, Dr. Ma Jun, uh, who is the director of the Center for Finance and Development at Tsinghua University, uh, also chairman of the China Green Finance Committee, uh, a member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the People's Bank of China, uh, and also one of the founding members of the International Network for Greening Financial System. Uh, we're also delighted to be joined uh, by uh, Yao Wang, uh, Director General of the International Institute for Green Finance and Director of the Research Center for Climate and Energy Finance at the Central University of Finance and Economics in Beijing. Um, Yao is also a member of the INSPIRE Advisory Committee, so uh, welcome uh, to both of you. Um, in terms of uh, format, uh, we'll have the presentation, as I say, from uh, Uli and, and Simon. Then we'll have a panel discussion uh, with Dr. Ma uh, and, and Yao. Uh, and then you'll be able to ask, uh, ask your questions. Uh, please uh, use the chat uh, function. Uh, unfortunately, we won't have opportunities for you to uh, ask your questions uh, verbally, um, but we'll take uh, questions from the chat function. Um, this uh, uh, webinar is recorded. Uh, and uh, will be made available uh, online uh, for you all to uh, listen and share uh, afterwards. Uh, with that introduction, I'd like to hand over to you, uh, Uli. Over to you, Uli. Thank you very much, uh, Nick, and uh, welcome, everybody. So just to mention that this webinar is uh, part of a research project on sustainable crisis responses of central banks and financial supervisors, which is uh, kindly supported by the Inspire Network. And there will be quite a number of uh, related events looking at how monetary financial authorities uh, can and should respond to the crisis in a, man a manner that uh, takes climate risks and other sustainability concerns into account. Next one, please. So Simon and I will briefly go through uh, our new publication uh, the Inspire Toolbox for Sustainable Crisis Response Measures. Uh, next one. Central banks, again, are playing a very central role in uh, the crisis response. And um, it's important that uh, the policies that are adopted during the crisis um, will take into account uh, longer term goals uh, in specifically climate and sustainability goals. And um, the policies that are currently being adopted, even though they're geared towards short-term pressures, uh, will have in many cases profound implications for long-term outcomes. And these need to be taken into account. Next one, please. There are broadly four reasons why central banks and supervisors should incorporate climate and sustainability factors into their crisis responses. First, uh, central banks uh, should take care that they won't be um, uh, loading up um, uh, climate risk in their own uh, balance sheet. Uh, so they should be um, basically doing what they have been starting to tell financial institutions um, that they need to take care of climate risk and in particular, when conducting asset purchase programs, um, 
climate risks need to be taken into account. Uh, secondly, uh, central banks and supervisors need to make sure that their supervisees uh, will take sustainability risks into consideration uh, so that um, the current uh, responses uh, and the lending that uh, banks uh, in particular undertake uh, will not lead to uh, further problems down the road. And of course, as guardians of uh, financial stability and the economy at large, uh, they also need to make sure that uh, no new systemic risks are built up. And last but not least, uh, central banks and supervisors should make sure that within their mandates, they support scaling up uh, sustainable investment in line with the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. And the financial stability aspect is a really important one. Liquidity enhancing measures uh, that are not aligned with sustainability objectives can contribute uh, to the buildup of sustainability related risk in portfolios of financial institutions and the system at large and lock in investment pathways that will hamper the achievement of a just transition. Right now, a lot of central banks and supervisors are uh, very rightly easing counter cyclical and other prudential instruments uh, to help financial institutions through the crisis to uh, stimulate uh, new credit. Um, and this is really important, but they need to make sure that uh, these counter cyclical measures are uh, calibrated in a sustainability um, uh, aligned way. Uh, so that financial institutions don't build up new risk. Um, this is really crucial. And um, it's important that the implementation of prudential instruments that account for climate risk and other sustainability risks should not be delayed, um, but rather strengthened right now. Um, we, know, we do know that we have actually very little time to address the climate challenge. So we don't have the luxury at this point in time uh, to um, interrupt the work of central banks and supervisors in addressing climate risks. Um, these need to be uh, addressed even now during the crisis. Next slide, yeah. And the good news is that there are actually quite a a lot of monetary and prudential instruments that can be calibrated in ways that account for climate and other sustainability related financial risks, or in ways that uh, will make them contribute to the achievement of climate and sustainability goals. Um, and I'm just gonna give four examples. Simon will um, uh, uh, um, uh, go through the larger menu of options. So first, uh, collateral frameworks can be adjusted to account for climate and other sustainability related financial risks, for example, by applying haircuts or excluding assets that are not aligned with sustainability goals. They can um, align refinancing operations with sustainability goals. Really important point is that reserve requirements and risk weights can be differentiated to account for uh, climate risk or other sustainability uh, risks. And last but not least, um, asset purchase programs uh, can exclude carbon intensive assets. And uh, I think this is also a very important point uh, because uh, this is also signaling uh, to the wider um, financial system uh, that these high risk assets should not end up in the balance sheets, neither of the central bank nor of individual financial institutions. Over to you, Simon. Yes, thank you, Uli. Um, I would like to now quickly walk you through, through our toolbox. So um, our toolbox is informed by, by global experience and we are, we are of course very aware that there's no one size fits all approach. And our toolbox therefore reflects differing uh, financial cultures, policy spaces and objectives of central banks and supervisors around the world. So, well, First, instruments that are seen as standards by some central banks may, of course, not be conventionally used elsewhere. And secondly, um, 
central banks and supervisors across different uh, jurisdictions operate, of course, within very different mandates and, and legal frameworks. So therefore, this, this, this is a, a toolbox that includes a lot of measures, but we, we, we don't have a one-size-fits-all approach here. Um, the toolbox itself is organized in three overall areas. We have monetary policy, prudential policy, and other. And then we have nine policy instrument subcategories. Uh, for each instrument, we point out how a conventional sustainability blind calibration could look like, or looks like, and how these instruments could be employed with a sustainability enhanced calibration. Um, yes, so first category is monetary policy. Here we have collectible frameworks, indirect monetary policy instruments, such as open market operations and reserve requirements. And um, then we have non-standard instruments, asset purchase programs, helicopter money, and monetary financing. And then finally, we have direct credit allocation instruments. So for most of these instruments, there are concrete uh, suggestions or, or proposals for how they could be aligned with sustainability goals. For others, for example, for collateral frameworks, this, much, uh, this work <clears throat> is still very much um, ongoing in research. The second part of the toolbox um, is on financial regulation and supervision. Here we differentiate between microprudential instrument, uh, instruments such as stress testing, disclosure, and Basel III instruments, which, which, could be, which could be aligned with sustainability objectives, for example, climate risk stress testing, mandatory ESG disclosure, and climate risk sensitive uh, calibration of different instruments, for example, risk-based uh, risk capital requirements. Then in the macroprudential instrument category, we would differentiate between um, cyclical instruments and cross-sectional instruments. For example, counter-cyclical capital buffers or large exposure restrictions could be calibrated with regard to systemic climate risks. And then finally, we have other policies to, to capture other instruments in which central banks are, are involved in the, also in the current crisis. Here we have further financing schemes and other initiatives, for example, corporate financing facilities or loan guarantees or financial sector bailouts. And these could be conditional on the reduction of CO2 emissions or the focus on sustainability enhanced activities. Um, then we have the management of central bank portfolios. Uh, well, here disclosure of climate related financial risks could be an important first step. The, the NGFS came out with a, with a good report on this. And then we have support for sustainable finance activities, which we, we argue should be rolled out anyway and not be delayed uh, in, in, in face of the crisis. Then we, um, yes, now the emerging evidence space. So to test our classifi uh, classification and toolbox empirically, we looked at all currently used crisis response measures implemented by banks and supervisors in countries with at least one NGFS member. So we, we, we looked at the NGFS set of countries, basically. And uh, yes, the in investigation is based on the IMF's policy uh, tracker. We looked at around 60 countries. And an interesting finding is that most, if not all instruments that we propose in our toolbox are currently used, but not with a sustainability enhanced calibration. And with regard to different instruments, we find that, well, on monetary policy, many central banks have moved very quickly um, to extend their collateral frameworks and to include a broader variety of, of um, and quality of assets, mostly with regard to SMEs. Yes, and then on supervision, many central banks and supervisors have eased counter cyclical capital buffers and general microprudential regulation and supervisory standards. So, while we have not been able to identify any monetary or prudential policy crisis response instruments that have been, um, well, that have been calibrated in a sustainability enhanced way, there are some positive examples. For example, there are ongoing efforts in China to, um, with regard to green uh, financial policies. There has been a launch of sustainable finance committees and frameworks in Mexico and the Philippines. And there have been multiple report launches by the NGFS, ECB, and the Bank of Force and others. So these, these initiatives are rolled out anyway. One interesting conclusion is that um, many changes have not been fully implemented yet, and the dynamic nature therefore provides a considerable scope to retrofit sustainability factors into, into many of these used instruments. 
And then secondly, this policy response also demonstrates that a broad set of instruments is actually at the disposal of central banks and supervisors. And we would argue that to, to some degree, this renders the ongoing debate redundant regarding the, availabil the availability of a number of these more conventional policy changes or, pol or, pol yeah, or policies in general. Some of these currently used instruments have been discussed in the past by central banks and supervisors as not being suitable for adjustment that would allow for, uh, for greening of the economy. However, quite a few have now used these instruments to support very specific sectors, yeah, mostly SMEs. And this bears the question of whether this creates, uh, created now some policy space and an opportunity to, to green central banking and scaling up green finance and to further include climate risks in, in binding regulation. My last slide. Um, yes, we have, we have two more upcoming webinars, one in the afternoon and one uh, later in, Ju in, 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 in July with the date to be confirmed. Yes, and that's, that's it from my side. Over to Nick. Um, Lee and uh, Simon, thank you so much for that. And, and I urge you all, if you haven't already, to uh, read the brief. Uh, I, I mean, it's very um, uh, methodical and very evidence-based. And I think as Simon suggested at the end there, I think there is a, a lot of scope um, as we're still sadly in, uh, in, in the midst of the economic uh, shock of uh, COVID, there's considerable scope for, for retrofitting and introducing sustainability measures into the broad portfolio of crisis response for central banks. So we'll now move uh, into the, the panel session. Uh, as I said, we're delighted to be joined by Dr. Ma uh, and, and Yao, um, and, and really looking to get your, uh, your insights on how uh, central banks have been uh, incorporating uh, green uh, finance factors, climate factors into their crisis response. Um, and also to really get your, your expert opinion and, and insights about, about the toolbox and how it can be used practically by central banks and supervisors as we, as we deal with this, uh, the immense shock of this, this, this crisis. So um, Dr. Ma, if I could start with you, if I may, um, your, your thoughts about how central banks have been trying to combine uh, green finance uh, agenda with uh, with crisis response, and your feedback on the on the toolbox. Uh, over to you, Dr. Ma. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Can you hear me? We can very, very loud and clear. Thank you. Um, now, thanks for the uh, very impressive report uh, uh, with so many tools, uh, some of which are uh, not expected uh, by myself, even though I worked uh, in the central bank before. Um, I would say uh, some of these uh, potential tools are useful and uh, could be applicable, but not all of them. Uh, maybe others are more for um, macro um, countercyclical adjustment rather than for sectoral based. Uh, uh, resource allocation. Uh, so this requires more detailed study and really checking with the, the central bankers who have been operating uh, these instruments more carefully. But broadly, I would say the following. I think the central banks and regulators can play the following role uh, in greening the financial system, especially in this particular moment uh, when the uh, greening of the stimulus package and recovery is so important. Um, the first thing the Central banks and regulators should do is to ensure that uh, there is a uh, usable uh, taxonomy for green and brown assets. Otherwise, uh, uh, the confusion of what's green, what's brown, uh, is going to lead to a lot of problems uh, within the uh, green finance space. And uh, we can certainly see that the taxonomy can come up by the private sector uh, after rounds and rounds of negotiation and consultation, but that's too inefficient and our experience in China, for example, uh, in the process of generating the green bond catalog, it was initiated by uh, the central bank led green finance committee and it was very efficiently done within six months. Um, that's one thing, taxonomy. The second thing is disclosure. Uh, the uh, requirement for disclosure vary across uh, different regions and different markets. For those markets that do not have semi-compulsory or compulsory requirements for disclosure, I think has been uh, ineffective in delivering the right numbers for the market to assess uh, what's green, what's brown uh, in the investment portfolio. So we really need to move towards uh, something uh, 
uh, with more compulsory elements of disclosure requirements. Uh, that's what's going to happen in China. By end of this year, I'm expecting regulators to come up with a mandatory requirement for environmental information disclosure for all listed companies and all bond issuers. Uh, this will substantially improve the quality and availability of environmental climate data for investors to consider as part of their investment process. Um, again, this cannot be done on a voluntary basis. Uh, once it's compulsory, it has to come from the regulator. The disclosure um, should be imposed, the requirement should be imposed not only on corporates, but also on financial institutions. Uh, that's why the central banks and the banking regulator, insurance regulator, security regulator will play a role uh, because these institutions are regulated by the financial regulators. And uh, over time, I would expect uh, the central bank and other financial regulators to require disclosure of climate and environment related information by banks, asset managers, and the insurance company. Although it's not a sort of a, a once for all uh, a requirement, it will be a very gradual process uh, because the capacity for disclosing, calculating uh, um, you know, indicators and uh, carbon related information are quite complex. And especially when we come to the forward looking information in the form of scenario analysis and stress testing, that's gonna take multi years uh, for the institutions to build capacity. But uh, we do have expectation that uh, uh, such information will be required to disclose. Um, the first thing that regulators should do is to put in some incentives. I think the reporter was very correct in pointing out to some incentive that's in place already. Uh, for example, in China, uh, the central bank has introduced this a green relanding facility, which is an incentive. Uh, essentially, the banks, if they have green assets on the balance sheet, for example, green loans and green bonds, they can use such green assets as collateral to come to the central bank and borrow cheap money. Uh, that's one incentive which we put in place already in China. And uh, of course, it doesn't have to be financially regulated. A lot of incentive can be done by the fiscal authority at the central and local level. And in China, most incentive, in fact, is, uh, are, are provided by local governments. A lot of local governments are providing uh, subsidies for interest payments, uh, guarantees, or uh, subsidized guarantees for green projects. So uh, these fiscal incentives are combined with the monetary and the regulatory incentive, which produce good results. Uh, Next thing which was mentioned in the report and I fully support is uh, uh, the central banks and the uh, other uh, government owned entities should green their portfolio. Uh, a lot of central banks are beginning to uh, adopt ESG principles and methodologies and increasing their green assets as percent of total assets. I think that's a trend to go. Um, and uh, uh, the last thing I'd like to mention as a role of central bank and regulator is the facilitation of market development. Uh, because a lot of products require the regulator to help in terms of defining the products, uh, regulating the disclosure of the products, and facilitating the uh, verification process of the products, and uh, providing information uh, channels to connect to the investors and uh, the product builders. So these things can be done certainly by the private sector uh, in some countries, but at least in our case, in China and many other developing countries, I think regulators can play a very important role in speeding up the process of market development. Back to you, Nick. Dr. Ma, thank you so much. Uh, five clear uh, areas for central bank action. We've got um, taxonomies, usable taxonomies, uh, market disclosure incentives um, from central banks. You, you highlighted green relending also fiscal, um, the central bank portfolio itself, and then the market development, which I think is a crucial point. Thank you so much for that. Um, over to you, Yao, if I, if I may, um, your reflections on, on how central banks can uh, better uh, integrate the sort of green dimension into their, their response to this crisis we face uh, today. So over, over to you, Yao, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Nick. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have learned a lot from uh, listening to Wooly and Simon's introduction of their report and uh, Dr. Ma's speaking. Uh, I think this report on uh, sustainable crisis response is a very timely one. Uh, it summarizes uh, at first hand how central banks and financial regulators can promote 
sustainable development uh, while responding to the crisis and how the win-win situation can be achieved. Uh, I think the report also uh, summarized the uh, uh, policy tools uh, already used by central banks and financial supervisors during the uh, COVID, uh, which uh, is a real and useful resource that can be an important reference for central bank uh, practitioners and also researchers. And just now, Dr. Ma has given a statement of both uh, a, a very uh, a good, a very good value. Uh, I very much agree with these points. Uh, I'm honored also to um, add some personal thinkings. Uh, first of all, uh, how have central banks and supervisors addressed climate and other factors in the crisis so far? Uh, what I see is that uh, now most central banks and supervisors are focusing on the traditional crisis response, uh, particularly for small and medium-sized enterprises and for uh, employment and growth. Uh, for example, in China, the central bank paid particular attention to targeted support for small and micro enterprises, taking out more than uh, 1 trillion RMB refinancing and rediscount for them. Uh, I personally believe that these central bank's measures are in line with the UN SDGs goals. Uh, recently, in my, uh, my institute, working together with uh, UNDP China office and other uh, institutions, uh, released the SDG finance taxonomy. Uh, according to this taxonomy, providing funds for public health, uh, small business and employment are definitely in line with the SDG goals. Uh, as for the consideration of climate and environmental related factors during the crisis response, um, it, it appears that now most central banks haven't yet taken uh, substantive actions. Uh, the reason I think uh, it's, it's that historically, climate change and the environmental factors haven't been a part of central bank's policy framework. Uh, however, uh, this give, I think this gives the main significance of this report released today. Um, I, I think most of you may know that the, the uh, BIS uh, launched a report, the Green's War Report, in uh, January this year. And uh, they, uh, in, in, the, in the book, they made the climate risks widely acknowledged. Uh, I, I hope that uh, the report released today will become also a similar success and become a basis for central banks' substantive launch of uh, sustainable crisis response. Uh, in terms of the analysis of the report itself, um, the policy tools have been summarized comprehensively. Maybe uh, based on the further research, the report could clarify the countries where different policy tools can be uh, applied uh, suitably and uh, which tools may work well or poorly uh, in certain scenarios. I hope if any central, uh, any central bank uh, implements these policies in the future, it can contribute uh, uh, relevant experience to the authors of this report. Uh, meanwhile, uh, these reports focus on mainly on central banks' policies. Uh, I think can can extend it with policies for other uh, financial regulators in the future. For example, in China, the Banking and the Insurance Regulatory Commission has also issued a series of credit policies, and, and I think that can also be included in, in the reports. Um, in terms of uh, policy practice, I think um, now all of the policy tools presented in the report are possible options. Uh, however, in considering the context of the ongoing pandemic and the possible second wave, and taking into account the specific characteristics of each tool, uh, my opinion is that the application of the uh, policy tools should be uh, sequential. So this is in fact my view uh, on maybe how next step of the central banks. Uh, uh, I think that the implementation of this so-called green central bank uh, policies should be high origin. So I totally agree with uh, just Dr. Ma said uh, to be very uh, specific, uh, 
um, first, it is important to prepare for the implementation of green regulation. So this is mainly to identify the greenness of projects by taxonomy, which has been developed well in Europe and in Europe and, and China. And just uh, 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 Dr. Ma uh, mentioned, and, the, and I know that uh, uh, China's uh, Banking and uh, Insurance Regulatory Commission also released now the new green finance guidelines to the commercial bank now. And second, with the um, ability to identify, uh, central banks should uh, prioritize the inclusion of green factors into policies already in, in place during the crisis re re uh, response. For example, in the, uh, in the collateral framework, uh, brown assets should be excluded, green assets should be uh, priori prioritized. And in refinancing policies, uh, targeted support for uh, green business could be uh, 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 should be uh, 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 applied. So um, uh, and incorporating green factors into these policies that central banks are uh, are already using doesn't require too much effort or too much cost. So maybe making green policies can really get off the ground in the midst of, of a busy uh, pandemic response. So in terms of uh, the sequencing of these policies, priority should be given to those that have a clear and direct green effect, as, uh, as this can give a strong signal to the market and better kick off the uh, green uh, recovery. And um, third, I think, is some entirely new policies that require uh, extensive capacity building can be only uh, piloted first and then gradually rolled out later. For example, um, in the report, we are, there are uh, prudential tools. This is a long-term prudential tools such as climate uh, stress testing and require both the development of new methodologies and widely accepted uh, scenarios, so which may involve a lot of effort from regulators. It can be uh, phrased uh, in gradually instead of rushing into the full scale during the pandemic. Uh, and first, uh, it should be noted that some short-term policies for uh, safeguarding liquidity, such as uh, standing lending facilities, um, may not be appropriate for supporting the green transition. The reason on, on the one hand is that uh, these policies need to uh, fulfill their uh, basic function of safeguarding the financial stability in the short term, and which should not be distracted. And on the other hand, uh, green transition is a long-term structural goal. So, and the short-term policies naturally lack the ability to provide the uh, long-term support. So, okay, so, uh, this is my, my points and I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yao, for, for, for layering in your, your perspectives. I think actually they very nicely complemented, um, uh, Dr. Ma, your, your points. You, you highlighted taxonomy, not just green, but sustainable development goals, which I thought that, that was interesting. And it was very good, I think, that you highlighted, I think, uh, a question for the further development of this toolbox, uh, which is actually which tools are most appropriate in different uh, circumstances. I mean, central banks, regulators, supervisors have quite different mandates and, and different financial cultures in different countries. I think that was very helpful. And then I like the way you 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 talked about particular instruments uh, which we can use now in the sequencing aspects, maybe refinance, refinancing, adjusting collateral, and then some of those longer term uh, issues uh, as well. So I'd like now to open up to uh, a panel discussion. So Dr. Maher, if you can uh, open up your, your video if that's possible. And I'd like to bring back um, uh, Uli Voltz and, and Simon Dickow uh, as well. Um, and uh, Uli or, or, or Simon, maybe any questions for, for, for Dr. Maher and, 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 and Yao from what you've heard? Uh, both, I think, quite complementary. Um, Uli, maybe first to you. Any, any, any thoughts uh, to, to build on what they've, they've given us? Yeah, it was a pleasure. Um, thanks so much uh, to both Marjun and, and Wang Yao. It's been uh, really great to, to listen to your thoughts. Um, so I'd be interested in, in, in hearing uh, your views on uh, dynamics across the Asia region. Uh, you're interacting a lot with uh, central bank supervisors, not only in China, but also uh, across the region. Uh, in the conversations that you've been having with, with colleagues in, in these institutions, uh, how do you sense the, the um, appreciation of, of the need to uh, maybe not implement the entire toolbox in one go, uh, but um, to take uh, some of these uh, uh, supposed measures into serious consideration and implement them? 
Thank you. And maybe Simon, if, if you wanted to add in your question as well, or have you any thoughts on that? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, I, I have a specific question with regard to monetary policy in China and the, uh, and the inclusion of sustainability criteria. Uh, criteria. Dr. Majun, you, you already mentioned targeted refinancing lines, and I also saw that the, um, that the PBOC used window guidance as a crisis response tool, at least at the end of last year. Um, do you see policy space to further green any specific elements of the, of the PBOC's monetary policy framework? Are there, are there other instruments that you, that you would consider useful to green? Okay, so, so Dr. Ma, maybe if you want to answer those, the, the regional uh, dimension and then quite specifically on, on China and monetary policy from Simon. Um, over to you, thank you. Right, on the regional um, aspect, I think uh, the most uh, um, discussed topic is uh, disclosure requirements, um, not only in China, but also in the region, for example, by uh, Hong Kong and uh, Singaporean. Uh, monetary authority as well as their uh, other financial regulators. I think uh, many of these regulators view disclosure as the very important and probably single most important uh, um, driver for uh, greening financial sector activities. Uh, it does have that role because once you require transparency on uh, the activities, the greenness, uh, it will change a lot of people's behavior, a lot of institutions' behavior in the, in the pain. For example, the banks will change, and the banks will be asking the borrowers to change their behavior, and the borrowers may be asking their suppliers to change their behavior. So uh, this disclosure thing uh, has a uh, very significant chain effect uh, in, uh, in in changing uh, uh, the the entire uh, production supply chains, and uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, requirements are became have become uh, mandatory. For example, Hong Kong, end of last year, they issued a regulation that requires a mandatory ESG information disclosure by all these companies. So uh, that's something I think many other places are now looking at. Incentives as well, uh, it's not so much from the central bank, but more from the government. Um, quite a few um, uh, governments, they offered the incentive, for example, for green bond issuance, not only for subsidizing the uh, uh, verification cost, but also um, for giving one-off grant uh, for those coming to the market to uh, issue green bonds. These are the things which I see as outstanding uh, 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 sort of uh, actions by governments and regulators in the, in the region. But I have not seen much on uh, the, the tools that you guys were mentioning, uh, for example, risk of weights. Uh, for example, uh, collateral, uh, and uh, uh, I'm not even mentioning context to buffer. I think uh, um, these things are still quite distant in the mindset of a lot of central bank regulators in the region. Uh, now back to what the Chinese central bank uh, can do. Um, I think uh, now some of the relanding uh, actions uh, can be more widely adopted. Um, the Relanding facility for green was announced in 2017, um, but uh, not every uh, place had enough dissemination of the availability of that facility. Uh, that's one area I've been stressing. So you have a tool, uh, you have an incentive, but making sure that everybody knows, uh, those green investors actually knows about this incentive um, and how to use incentive is very important. Sometimes even more important than the incentive itself. Uh, that's one area for, for further work, uh, which requires the local branch of the uh, central bank to disseminate information and also require demonstration projects to be done. Um, you know, certain commercial banks financing a whole bunch of green projects use this facility and they should then uh, put out a, a, a report on how this facility was used by this particular case and letting the entire market know. That's one area of, uh, of further work. And the other thing I've been proposing, and I uh, think uh, uh, there's still a lot of scope for further discussion and the refinement of the idea, which is the risk weight adjustment. Um, I noted that the, the French bank, which is Natissis, uh, has introduced by itself a adjustment to the risk weights, um, raising the risk weights for brown and reducing the risk weights for green, uh, which makes it technically possible for many other countries to do it and for the uh, financial regulators uh, and central bank to consider. 
So this is an area we are uh, discussing uh, now in China as a potential option. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ma. Maybe, uh, Yao, the, the, your, your perspective on this sort of regional point uh, and also the question of, of maybe particular tools in China. One, one interesting question from, from the floor from Dr. Arundam Sakar, um, particularly thinking about um, your thoughts, if there are any, any, any about developing countries in the region. Um, uh, Dr. Sakar mentions Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan, where obviously issues of basic access to credit is often or of most immediate importance to them let's say green finance concerns so um, over to you Yao if I may thank you uh, okay I think in response to the uh, unprecedented crisis of COVID uh, central banks now they um, have actually been overburdened uh, not only do they have to face a short-term liquidity shortage and insufficient demand problems of traditional crisis, but they also have to face new problems such as uh, lack of repayment capacity of firms in the long run and the unexpected um, decline in uh, supply capacity and maybe second wave outbreaks and so on. So this has uh, already uh, overburdened uh, the central banks. Of course, this uh, doesn't mean that the central banks should, should forget about sustainable development and allow uh, carbon emissions to gradually return to or even uh, exceed pre-crisis levels, uh, which may uh, uh, bring new risks. Uh, I think there is a consensus among all of us here today that we should seize the opportunity of the recovery to uh, promote uh, sustainable development. So that's why. So my suggestion that we uh, we uh, uh, should um, uh, pi, uh, prioritize the inclusion of green green factors into policies already uh, in place during the uh, crisis response. Just I uh, just like I mentioned. So. Uh, uh, also in the report uh, already uh, listed the collateral framework and the refinancing policies. Uh, if we integrate green factors into these uh, policies already exist, I think it, it is well uh, more easier for for uh, other countries. And in China, actually, China already uh, issued uh, People's Bank of China and also uh, CBIRC, they issued some, uh, some measures and including to uh, increase the support of accurate monetary and credit policies and uh, also uh, guided the reduction of lending rates and also uh, op uh, optimize the uh, credit investment structure, and just uh, and also uh, the strengthened policy coordination and the linkage with with uh, financial policies with other uh, industry policies, fiscal policies. So I think this is all uh, a, a, just like a package. But we uh, we should uh, figure out uh, what what uh, maybe in different countries there's. Uh, uh, conditions are different, so we can choose what kind of uh, 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 policies are, uh, should be prioritized in in one country. Uh, and, uh, uh, and 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 China, I think, based on uh, experience, the uh, the uh, uh, special incorporation of green factors still require a high level of awareness among central bankers, among central banks, and also coordination of. Um, various departments within the central bank. So this need to need a large number of well-documented evidence for the urgency of environmental and the social risks, and also for the need to prevent, prevent them. And for the uh, co uh, and also um, the uh, relationship they call uh, theorems of economic uh, recovery and the green transition. So, uh, this is exactly what now the NGFS and Inspiri are currently doing, I think. Yeah. Yeah, many thanks for, for that. And I also just wanted to pick up on one of the comments you, you meant about sort of, yeah, central banks obviously have been working uh, around the clock, really, in terms of the sort of trying to stabilize uh, the financial system and, and support the economy in, the, in, the, in this crisis. And I think there is a, a, a practical question about, uh, and one of the questioners has, has brought this up, Antal French Kovac, uh, about, about sequencing and so on and prioritization uh, in terms of integrating green finance factors. So I think that would be an interesting, interesting one to go further. But, but maybe if we could talk a little bit about the international dimension. Um, uh, Dr. Ma, you, you've obviously 
uh, when China was host of the G20, you led on putting green finance on the agenda. You were one of the founders of the uh, NGFS, the Network for Green Financial System. Uh, and also China is, is co-chair of the, um, this international platform of sustainable finance with the, with the EU. Where, where do you think uh, these sort of international platforms can best uh, play a role in ensuring that uh, central banks' actions in this uh, crisis are aligned with sort of green finance uh, objectives. Uh, where, where do you see the potential? I mean, there are a number of these platforms, maybe NGFS uh, and this uh, sustainable finance platform are the two most prominent at the moment. Uh, over to you, Dr. Ma, and then Yao and Uli and Simon, your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the NGFS and international platform sustainable finance uh, might be the two most relevant platforms for central banks and financial regulators. As you know, the NGFS was launched uh, about two years ago. Uh, initially, it started with only eight countries central bank and now expanding to more than 50 countries. It's uh, working on many different subjects. Um, I am chairing the uh, supervision work stream under NGFS, which is now producing two reports uh, to be released in July this year. That's actually uh, next month. Uh, one is called the uh, overview of environmental risk analysis. And the other one is called occasional paper on case studies of environmental risk analysis methodologies. The first one is the official NGFS report, uh, which summarizes the existing methodologies in a non-technical way, um, especially on how to do scenario analysis and the stress testing um, so that the financial institutions can make a forward-looking assessment on the financial risks arising from environmental and climate exposure. A second document is a much larger uh, piece of work, which involves, uh, I think, uh, something like 500 page. Uh, Oli is one of the uh, co-editors uh, uh, with me uh, in editing this report. It's, I think it took us at least nine months just to edit the uh, text of 37 chapters. And uh, uh, this is a, a huge volume, which collects um, most of the existing methodologies from a large number of banks, asset managers, financial uh, and, and insurance companies, as well as third-party uh, service providers and universities, on um, how to build the models uh, to do these uh, uh, stress testing, scenario analysis, ESG integration, and uh, uh, other uh, uh, new methodologies. So uh, I think it will be a very interesting reference book for the entire financial sector for the coming years, uh, if you decide to uh, move in that space of assessing future uh, climate-related and environmental-related financial risks. And uh, this thing, uh, once it's published, I think will be promoted um, by the NGFS and also by many central banks and regulators around the world. The other major piece of NGFS work is to uh, develop uh, uh, methodologies and guidelines for central banks to assess climate risks. Um, so it's at an aggregate level for the whole country, for the whole financial system, see how uh, climate-related risks are uh, impacting financial stability and what the central bank and other regulators can do to uh, minimize, uh, you know, these uh, risks. And the third piece of NGFS work is uh, related to market development and also central banks' role in uh, investing in green and sustainable assets. Uh, this is something I mentioned earlier on how to bring the portfolio to the bank themselves. I think all these uh, work streams are producing something very useful for all central banks in the world uh, and financial regulators in the world to look at. IPFS, uh, IPSF is a new platform launched last year uh, and the China joined end of last year. And uh, uh, both China and EU uh, have agreed to uh, develop a joint research program on how to harmonize the Chinese green finance and the European sustainable finance standards. Uh, this is, uh, is going to be kicked off uh, soon, and uh, I think a working group uh, will be uh, put together to to develop uh, uh, views on this uh, very important issue. Thank you, Dr. Ma. Um, yeah, any thoughts on this international mention? Then Uli and Simon, I'll come over to you. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, there are uh, some uh, international platform uh, very uh, played a great role, uh, except NGFS is among uh, central banks and financial regulators. Uh, and in the financial market, there are also some uh, important 
important uh, uh, platforms such as uh, UNPRI and the Responsible uh, Banking Principle, and also uh, SBN uh, Sustainable Banking uh, Network, and uh, also Dr. Ma lead the uh, Green uh, Investment Principle, and some uh, and some other this kind of uh, platform. And also uh, academic level, we know we are, now we have an uh, Inspiry. Inspiry is um, we now we collect. Uh, I think most of the uh, uh, academia in, in in the world to contribute to NJFS works and also um, uh, 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 Oxford and other uh, universities uh, we have uh, some graphy. So this is all network important network to uh, promote uh, uh, green finance together. Okay, thank you. Excellent, Uli, uh, Simon. Um, we're, we're actually got nine minutes left and this is a great panel and I'd like to uh, uh, ensure that Marjun was with us and Yao was with us for another hour, but unfortunately we only got nine minutes. So um, I would be interested um, particularly in your thoughts about where we should be prioritizing our, our focus in this, 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 this toolbox. We've had a number of um, suggestions already um, from, from Dr. Ma um, in terms of taxonomy, uh, in terms of disclosure, in terms of central bank portfolio. Um, we've had other suggestions around re refinancing um, and, and collateral frameworks and so on. But maybe your thoughts, and maybe I'll come back to you, Dr. Ma and, and Yao as well, sort of where do you think, uh, given that we are in a crisis, um, where do you think we should, which tools we should focus on, particularly in terms of maybe inter international cooperation to build that capacity to connect these two agendas of crisis response and, uh, and green finance? Maybe first you, Uli, and then maybe Simon, then I'll come back to Dr. Mar and Yao. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I very much agree with the point uh, that was made about the sequencing. And uh, it's, it's clear that we are right now in the midst of a very severe crisis situation and that is also putting a lot of stress and possibly will be putting even more stress on financial institutions so uh, this may not be the moment to introduce uh, you know broad sweeping uh, new regulations and burdens on the financial sector uh, at the same time as mentioned before we don't have the time to wait another five years until we get serious about uh, introducing all these uh, prudential measures so what I think uh, what central banks and supervisors should be doing right now is uh, send very clear signals to the financial sector, to the world, that they are very concerned about the buildup of uh, climate risk and other sustainability risks. So um, I think what they all should be doing now is basically uh, announce uh, that uh, there will be mandatory disclosure requirements, as Dr. Ma also highlighted. Um, so they don't have to be uh, uh, brought in immediately, but the announcement effect that there will be disclosure requirements uh, for environmental climate risk uh, starting next year or so uh, would be an important signaling effect. Uh, and then uh, also very importantly, uh, they should be all uh, announcing their plans to implement climate stress testing. Um, and again, uh, this will not have an immediate effect on what's happening right now, but the signaling effect and the anticipatory effect uh, should uh, play an important role. And last not but least, uh, I would like to emphasize that uh, central banks uh, that are engaging in uh, quantitative easing policies and asset purchase programs in the corporate sector, and this now also involves an increasing number of emerging market central banks, um, they need to make sure that these asset purchase programs are in line um, with uh, uh, the Paris Agreement. So um, uh, very close to us here uh, in London, uh, Frankfurt uh, and other places around the world, certainly also in, in, in DC, uh, central banks uh, ought to stop uh, purchasing dirty assets. Um, and this will also have important signaling effects for the rest of the financial sector. Thanks. Uh, I think almost as you were speaking, uh, Charlene Watson also mentioned the Paris Agreement and particularly the Article 21C, where governments um, and I, I, by, by extension central banks are required to make financial flows consistent with low carbon development and, and resilience. So I think a good, a good link there. Thanks very much. Roy. Simon, your thoughts and maybe we should, maybe we should be focusing our efforts, particularly in the next iteration of this toolbox. 
only only very briefly since Uli already mentioned a lot of um, <clears throat> very good points. So I think um, it will be an interesting challenge for for international networks such as the NGFS to to find suitable frameworks that not just that don't just work for central banks and advanced economies that, that but that also work for emerging markets and developing economies. And I think I think it will be quite difficult to develop. I mean, this is also a challenge we faced in this in this toolbox, or something we found in our empirical um, analysis, that central banks are, of course, using very different tools. And so, I think an interesting an interesting starting point could be to further look into collateral frameworks and to first assess whether they um, whether they account for relevant risks, and then secondly to discuss whether also other scaling up dimensions. Are, are suitable for different collateral frameworks because if collateral frameworks um, appropriately in, incorporate um, climate and environmental risks, this would have implications for, of course, all other monetary policy instruments, from refinancing lines to to OMOs to uh, to asset purchase programs. So I think that would be an, an area where where research should focus. And I, I might also mention that Inspire is also commissioning one specific project on. On, on how collateral, on how the ECB and the um, bank, no, how the European collateral framework could be greened. So I think that would be an interesting area because it would also then be very relevant for um, for developing and emerging markets. Thank you, Simon. Uh, yes, I mean, and just to highlight for you, um, we we now have twenty six research projects as part of the Inspire portfolio of, of, of projects, uh, and uh, that includes the monetary policy, but also our new suite of five projects focusing on the effectiveness of central bank uh, instruments in terms in in terms of greening uh, the financial system. So please look on the Inspire uh, website and see see the full portfolio of projects. So maybe some closing thoughts um, from from you, Dr. Ma and Yao, and then. Um, if we have time, Uli and Simon, then we'll close. Um, just some cl any closing thoughts, particularly where, where we might want to go next, uh, Dr. Martiu. I, I think uh, uh, there might be a few what I call low-hanging fruits uh, for central banks, so not necessarily in every country, but in some countries to consider. Uh, one is uh, that uh, some central banks are already providing low-cost financing for certain sectors or certain type of companies uh, through certain financial institutions, such as uh, financing SMEs at low cost, right? If this is available, then just adding another target, um, which is green, uh, into the whole package, I think will be uh, relatively easy to implement. So not only financing uh, SME at the low cost, but also financing SME and the green assets or green companies. The second low hanging fruit is uh, uh, for those central banks which has asset purchase program, um, they should consider buying green bonds. Uh, because green bonds are already available on the market and it's well defined, and uh, uh, as long as they are buying treasuries, uh, why not uh, you know buying uh, green bonds with uh, um, you know good um, credit ratings? That's another uh, relatively minor adjustment to their current operation, and that's what I call a low hanging fruit as well. The third thing is on disclosure um, because a lot of uh, uh, places have some taxonomy already. For example, um, Europe has its uh, sustainable finance taxonomy. Uh, based on that taxonomy, it can uh, be required that the banks or other financial institutions begin to disclose their green assets or green operations right, based on the taxonomy. And uh, I think if we can speed up the process, it will help the recovery uh, to be greener. And also within that disclosure space, if the regulators can consider requiring mandatory disclosure of environmental climate information for government-sponsored or government-funded projects, uh, that's what I see as relatively easier. Uh, because uh, you know, being the government, you want to be greener, you want to fight climate change, and you need to make sure that your own money, your own projects are green and low carbon. And that's why you have to disclose. Excellent. So, yeah, would you like to add any fruit to the fruit bowl of the low-hanging fruit? We've had three items of fruit suggested. Um, one or two items of fruit from you? 
Okay, two points. I think uh, back to the toolbox, I think um, uh, uh, in the short term, maybe uh, uh, refinancing and rediscounting and uh, uh, special refinancing and also targeted reduction in reserve, uh, it is uh, 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 suitable for uh, for the uh, central banks now to uh, to 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 do to do, and also uh, the second point is the how yeah. the monetary policy and the physical policy. How to coordinate physical policy? Also, I think in this uh, uh, special uh, period, uh, central banks and also Ministry of Finance maybe can should consider. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, we got five fantastically delicious items of fruit in the low hanging fruit um, bowl. Uh, we have many more tools in the toolbox. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ma, Yao, Simon, Uli, for, for this discussion. I've, I've learned a lot. Thank you all uh, for joining uh, you on, on, online. Um, and please do get in touch uh, with us uh, as, as authors, um, because we want to uh, enrich this toolbox. We want to make it very, very useful and practical uh, for central banks and supervisors. And please do uh, become part of the wider Inspire um, family. Uh, and look out for our next uh, commissions and calls for proposals. So, so thank you all. And if some of you are able to stay up, um, there is another call this afternoon, um, including with uh, uh, Luis uh, Pereira de Silva, who's one of the authors of the Green Swan Report. So um, that is at 5 p.m. Uh, British time. So thanks again. Um, lovely to have you all. And uh, well, let's continue the discussion offline. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Yao. Thanks, everyone.